in the afternoon. At that moment, it dawned on the Father the exact time that Jesus spoke the words, he will live. After that, he believed. And when he told his family about this amazing encounter with this Jesus, they believed too, sorry. This was the second sign Jesus performed when he came back to Galilee from Judea. Thanks be to God for this, his precious given word. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, your word is a light to our path, a lamp to our feet. We come to this scripture and we need you. We need you to speak to us, to guide us, to put us on the path you've called us to. To be in John's gospel again. I mean, uh, I said before, John is perhaps my favorite gospel anyway, but um, we've had a great time to worship God at Christmas. Um, but it's so good to be back in this gospel because John, I don't know how much people of you read. Have any of you ever read Sebastian Falks, the novelist? He's written books like um, quite a lot of fairly famous books. Anybody read him? Yeah, so Morag's read him. You, you've read him too, haven't you? One of the things I would notice about Sebastian Falks, if he was to write a novel about this room, he would take the first 20 pages to tell you about that banner. And you could have spent 100 pages before he'd actually told you what we were doing because he's so detailed in his description. He goes on about so many things that you often read a book of his and you go, you're going to tell me the story or just what the room looked like. And, and he's so good, but it's very detailed. And he uses up a lot of space without actually saying very much. Whereas John is not a short gospel, but there is not a word wasted. Each scene is powerful. Each scene gives us a little bit more of how John, the beloved disciple, saw the Jesus that he came to believe was God. Each scene is another facet, another part of the picture of who John saw Jesus to be as the Lord and the risen Savior. And so it's it's valuable to us this moment here. And in this scene, we've known before Christmas that Jesus was in Samaria. He was ministering to the Samaritan woman and they saw people come to faith. But he comes back now to Galilee. And in this moment, we see something simple, but it's critical. We see the evidence of faith. We see the impact of faith and we see the effect of faith in this official. He goes from a place where he'd heard of Jesus to a place where he's telling everybody about him, where at the end, him and his whole household are saved. They believe. And so it's really exciting to look at this simple story with a miraculous event in it that helps us see new life, its effects, and how a relationship with God happens and how genuine faith carries with it evidence. Because Jesus knew this. There were many that looked at him and saw him and said, yeah, you know, you're God. But they didn't do anything about it. Um, you know, James reminds us that words without deeds is dead. We want to see faith in action. And this man's faith, it goes into action and it's very encouraging. So anyway, so Jesus has been in Samaria. There's been um, Samaritans saved there. This woman and many others, that image of the fields being white for harvest as Samaritans came and made commitments to him and his shocked disciples see all of this. But he now comes back after a festival. They've been down in Jerusalem. Not sure which festival, but he's been down Jerusalem, he's been in Samaria, he's going back home. But he doesn't go home home, because if you look across to Luke 4, and as you see at the beginning of this, Nazareth, where he was born, he had been there, but Luke 4 shows us that he was rejected, that he was unable to do but the most meager of miracles because there was no faith. Remember, again, the importance of faith in the community of Christians, of faith for believers. Without faith, the amount that God does is very meager. And Jesus, who was 
full of God's power. Even he, the scriptures show us, needed faith in order to do those mighty works. He needed belief. And here today, this official beliefs um, in Cana, in this place we only hear of a tiny bit. But he stayed away from his home. And yet his mission is now going to center around Galilee. As we look forward into John's gospel, because John shows us a three-year story. The others show us maybe a year, um, maybe a little bit more, but not as much length of time. As we see it, except when he's at a festival, Galilee is where he works. Galilee is the tr strategic hub for Jesus' ministry. And it, I was reflecting on this, you know, um, Galilee is a lot, was, not is, because Galilee is not like that now, but Galilee then is a lot like London today, like our big cities. They are strategic locations for the gospel, for the spread of the kingdom. You know, it's like us. What are we? We're the church on the roundabout. We're on three bus routes. We're on, for our little part of Morden, major roads. When people come on the 163, the 293, the 413, they come past us all of the time. It only takes a little bit of a road close sign that there, as there is in Lower Morden Lane, to help make this whole area be in chaos for days, as any of you driving around have known over the last week, as they, I don't know, maybe they've lost a contact lens or something. I'm not sure what they're actually doing. They're doing something. Um, we're in a strategic place. And these strategic places are key for the spread of the gospel. They are key to bring God's word to those who are perishing. And why is this? Well, simply because we, like Galilee was, are living in a strategic, interconnected location, a place with immense volumes and transport possibilities. You can get around here in so many ways. You can connect with so many different cultures. Some of you commute to work on the tube, on cars. You know this. We're full of people. And this are places where cultures mingle, where ideas spread. These are places generally where there is an openness to new ideas, to change, where people are seeking meaning, finding their way, trying to provide for themselves and for their families. And though, as John and Luke tell us, Jesus had no honor in Nazareth, John tells us here that Galilee as a whole welcomed him. They welcomed him. They had faith that there was more going on with this man than simply what you could see at the level of him. Sure, there's that person called Jesus. And so they, many of them, were going down. You know, the law said that if you were to go to a feast, they wanted all um, Israelite males to go, but you only had to really go if you lived within 20 miles. And the fact that the Galileans are well over 100 miles away shows that when Galileans were going down to Jerusalem regularly for the three festivals, for harvest, for Passover, um, and for tabernacles, anyway, the third one is booths or tabernacles, I think, the three times they should go, the fact these lot went in big numbers showed they were really looking for God. They were keen in faith to find God. And so they see Jesus and they honor him and they believe because in Jerusalem they'd seen him doing things. And now in their own land, they start to see him do some things. Well, here we go. That kind of bigs that up enough, really. But I want to say to you this. The first evidence of faith is that when we see Jesus, we recognize that he is more. We recognize and honor that he is extra to us and that's rightly so the bible tells us that those feelings as faith starts to expose in a person are there because when we see jesus and we know he's not ordinary we think he's extraordinary we think he's more what we're doing is we're beginning to connect with the truths of scripture that jesus was the son of god as john told us earlier that he became flesh and he lived among us, that he indeed was the savior of the world. He was the one that God loved, the one and only son who was sent to save people from perishing. And 
If you want to know what Jesus' favorite term for himself was, it wasn't God. It wasn't son of God. It was actually son of man. Jesus' favorite way to describe himself was that he was like us. He was the son of man who'd come to share our skin, our struggles, our suffering, who would experience all of life's trials, who was touched by our infirmities, who was qualified by his sinlessness to lift us from our suffering. So he was the son of man. He was no mere mortal, though. Very God and very much the same as us. So there we go. And that's more than saying Jesus was a good man, because there are many people who say Jesus was a good man. And they'll say, oh, I'm a good man. When Jesus was asked about that, he says, you call me good. Actually, there's no one good apart from God. But you're right to call me good because he knew he was God, but he never lorded it over others. See, honoring Jesus as more begins in esteeming who he was, respecting what he said, trusting what he asked for. And you, many of you, honor Jesus in that way because you see that he was unique. You see that he was God come down and it draws you to worship him. And that's true, isn't it? Jesus is due all our worship, all the honor we can bring, all of the sacrifice that doing that entails because to worship Jesus means you deny yourself. And it's very easy to worship yourself. But to worship God as a person of faith means you give him the worship, the exaltation, all of the reverence due his name. You see what he said, what he commanded and what he offered. You see that it's holy and you know that it's faithful. And in response, you obey these things and keep him lifted high. It's no easy thing to be a person of faith. Because people who believe that Jesus is God, is their God, they pay the price of ongoing surrender of their life to Christ. They're ready to serve him as Lord. People who have faith in him, they welcome his presence. They welcome the Holy Spirit. You know, if you struggle with the Holy Spirit, it doesn't mean you don't have faith in God. It's just that reality of having God trying to live in you is hard because we battle. Our old self, Paul says, battles against what God is saying. But as people of faith, we need to receive his presence. Ask the Holy Spirit to walk with us on life's daily path. People of faith want Christ on a daily basis. They take up their cross of denying themselves. And yet recognize that they do that not to be a martyr but because that they might by faith live in the blessings of god god with them god who can be seen who can be heard who can be felt who can be tasted and even smelt it's not strange the smelt but we receive god through the whole of our beings so john as a gospel writer goes now to express to us that faith comes into the family of the official of Herod's palace. Now, this is quite a well-important person in Herod's court. Now, remember, this is not the Herod who killed all of the babies when Jesus was a baby, you know, when he was young. This is not the one who slaughtered the innocents, because that was Herod the Great. This is one of his sons, also called Herod, because going to be nepotistic why not go for it um this is one of the herods because there was two of them um this is the herod in the north this man works for him and this is the man who takes john the baptist's head this herod cuts his head off because it amused him this man works for somebody who's pretty evil and we're about to see he's coming to faith he, scripture tells us, was open to Jesus. He'd gone to Jerusalem and seen 
Jesus at work and saw that Jesus was more than just a man. We must all rec recognize one truth here because John tells us this. He was desperate. His son was going to die. Now, I pray I'm never in that place where I'm looking at the reality of my son going to die. But I know if I was in that place, for me to get up from his side and to go 15 or 20 miles away from where I lived to find someone to help, I know that would be a massive act. Because look, if you want to find someone and they're 15 miles away from you now, what would you do? You'd use your phone. You'd Google it. You'd call an Uber. You'd get in your car. You'd grab your neighbor and say, I know you're busy, but you're doing this. You'd do whatever it took to get there. But you generally have some sense of how to get to the person that you're trying to find. But if you were a parent and I said to you, look, there's someone that can help you, but um, they're in Marlebone. And you'd say to me, well, where? And I said, I don't know. I know they were in Marlebone. You'd have to go there and look and go and find him. This is what that official does. So his desperation is really powerful. It's really important, though. He goes himself and desperately searches for Jesus. And he finds him. Verse 47, this is the scene between them. Jesus is no mere man, but the official comes to him and he begs. And I mean begs. You know, sometimes children might beg for something from you and they've done it for a few seconds and you think, well, if they'd have done that for half an hour, I might have given in. But he begs, he's desperate. He's properly begging, like on his face, desperate. Tears, snot, the works, proper. Jesus, you've got to help me. He would not shut up. He was persistent in his desperation. Jesus knows his heart. And it isn't that Jesus knows he's going to make a commitment, but Jesus knows that he believes. He knows that he believes that Jesus is more. And obviously, he says something quite difficult. He says, look, you lot won't believe without signs. And he speaks to the man, but he also speaks to the crowd. You lot won't believe without signs. That's really harsh, isn't it? Unless you see a sign, you won't believe. It's not the only time Jesus says that to people. But then what does he say to him? But, because you've got faith, go. Your son will be healed. What would you do? Would you go? I, I have to seriously consider the possibility that's a moment that if I was him, I would be tempted to clobber Jesus round the head, stick him on a donkey, tie him up, and drag him back to my house. How amazing is that moment? Because you know what? The reason he doesn't assault Jesus and drag him is because he believes. He believes. Go. Your faith has healed him. Go. He'll be well. You wouldn't leave unless you believed, would you? Would you just go, I have work. All right then. Sorry to bother you, Jesus. Have a nice lunch. He believes. He believes and he goes. And he's now basically got the best part of a day's walk, unless he could marathon run 15, 20 miles through the desert. He's got the best part of a day's walk to get home. Couldn't call. Couldn't get there quicker. If you look at verse 50, we see this. New life is really, really where this begins, isn't it? Go, your son will live. And he believes. Just rewind a second. Let's go back to that moment where 
Jesus says to him and to the crowd, you won't believe unless you see signs or wonders. I think sometimes we need to grasp this reality that the Lord responds to our faith, that we wonder perhaps why God seems quiet, but yet our faith is, is only in embo. It's not burning a light. We sometimes perhaps need to be more persistent in prayer until the Lord answers, not saying, Lord, well, I'll pray for a month. And if you haven't done it, clearly it's not your will. You know, I still remember a good man saying to me once, I've been praying for my children for 30 years now that they've become Christians and they haven't. Should I stop? And I'm like, did God tell you to stop? No. Then why would you stop? Because God hasn't finished doing what he's doing. You know, sometimes we cease from faith because we don't believe that God will answer. Sometimes we give up and we disbelieve in God. And God is looking for our faith. The official goes. It is actual faith that moved him. But you know, I would say this, not just to you, but to anyone. If there is another reason why he chose to leave then, and it's not faith, because you know what agnostics and um, atheists are like, they'll say, well, he left because the wind blew him westward or something. Um, there's no other reason. He goes, and on the way home, he meets the servants. Praise God for this. And he says to them, he, oh, that's right, they say to him, sir, your boy's getting well. Tell me the hour, he demands. And you know, their answer confirms his faith. Because they say to him, this was the hour. And then he goes, you know, just like a man, like we do. Eventually our brains get into gear and we go, yes, that was when he said it. That was when Jesus said, go, he'll be well. Their answer confirms his faith and his joy in Jesus is growing by the second and his trust is multiplied. What a wonderful scene of faith this is. And you know, his faith grows more as genuine faith should. Because when we get near God and God acts, we can't be silent. Can't be silent. Perhaps sometimes we're silent because we're not having the faith in seeing God act. But he has seen this. I can't imagine how much he hugged his son and his whole family. But when he gets there, the Bible tells us it's not just he who believes when he explains what happened, but his whole household believes. This whole household believes. Faith is like a domino rally, isn't it? You don't know what will happen next when you have faith. As we look at things like our ark in there, our boys brigade, our girls brigade, we look at them and when the leaders are in there sharing these little bits with the kids, we don't know what that will do. But let us have faith that actually it then turns into the next stage that kids are going home and converting their parents. People are coming and meeting the Lord, and we have faith to speak to them, faith to pray for them, faith to let the Holy Spirit minister through us. And then it spreads out like wildfire, because we're in, like they were, one of those strategic places for the gospel. John finishes by saying, obviously, the wine in Cana was the first, but this was the second sign of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Now, you know, you might think that sometimes you have it hard being a Christian. And you might think you've had a lot of persecution in London. I, I don't think it would have been easy for them to tell people. I can't imagine the conversation when he told Herod. By the way, Herod, I'm now a follower of Jesus Christ. He might have cost, that might have cost him everything, including his head. I would like to take people's heads off or nail them to the walls. Didn't matter. He loved Jesus enough to tell others so they might find God's glorious salvation. And my simple prayer from a, a, a wonderful scripture like this is, may our faith be at least equal or surpassing that man's. Amen.